years back, um, four and a half, maybe five years ago, I stood up here on this stage and I made a confession to those that were here, which is probably <laughs> not very many of you since our church changes over so much with people transitioning in and out of the area. But some of you may have remembered this. I, I shared a, a sin that, um, that I had committed back when I was at Wake Forest University. Uh, I stole something. And uh, still not proud of what I stole to this day. I stole this book from the Z. Smith Reynolds Library at Wake Forest University. I mean, technically I borrowed it, right? <laughs> I just haven't returned it in a few decades. But uh, the title of this book is The Mass Media Election, How Americans Choose Their President. Now, I think I've read more in this book this past week than I read for the class I was supposed to read it for a few decades ago, right? And I really, after looking at some, I don't really think they missed this book at all. Um, this, this book is all about how the media influenced uh, presidential elections, specifically, ready for this, the 1976 presidential election. But I love this line in the book. It says, an analysis of the news content of network television, daily newspapers, and weekly news magazines reveals how the news media covers the campaign, the candidates, and the issues. Some of you are like, what are daily newspapers and what are weekly magazines? Because you're still trying to figure that out. I'm sure Wikipedia has something on that. But here we are in the year 2022. And we get so much of our political coverage, our information on candidates. We get information about um, uh, issues that are out there from so many different places than the three that are listed here in this particular book. We have a plethora of cable news that we can watch that runs the gamut from many different sides. We, we get our information from people that we've never met on Twitter. We get it from celebrities on TikTok. We get it from our dads on, on Facebook, right? Not to mention some of our friends in Russia and China who also like to share political thoughts with us too. I mean, there's so much information that comes into us today when it comes to something like, like politics. And, and when you begin to have conversations with people, you're going to find that everybody has an opinion. And, and not only do people have opinions, but almost every single person seems to be an expert. So that's why we thought we'd finish up the series, Gods of War Today, going with a bang and talking about the God of politics. Because I can tell you that it seems like the God of politics might be the one God that more people struggle with, that more people are connected to, that more people worship than any of the rest of them that we have talked about in this series. That politics have become their idol. Their God is a person, the religion is a party, and their theology is a platform. Before we worship God, and before we fully follow Jesus, we'll worship that politician, we'll follow a platform, and we'll give our allegiance to a party. But, but here's my question. At what cost are we willing to do this? Because I, I don't know about you. I know people who have lost friendships because of, of their view of politics. I know family members who don't speak to each other anymore because of the God of politics. I know people that have even lost their jobs because of the God of politics. And maybe worse as I've seen people that have walked away from Jesus because someone else has allowed the God of politics to take over their life. And when we get to that place where the God of politics runs our life, and that is the thing that we worship, we will get lost. And sometimes we will lose almost everything because of something we feel like should be very important to us. But I don't think politics are supposed to be as important to us as God intended. I think sometimes we get lost in that world and we forget about worshiping the God, the one who loves and cares for us. So the question is, how do we battle, how do we fight this God of war? How, how do we move beyond allowing the God of politics to rule everything in our life? Well, let's start by talking about what our role is when it comes to politics. 
And so we're going to spend a lot of our time this morning in Romans chapter 13. If you've got a Bible, you can turn there. It's going to be up here on the screen. But Romans chapter 13, starting with verse 1, here's what we read. It says, Everyone must submit to governing authorities, for all authority comes from God, and those in positions of authority have been placed there by God. So we have Paul who's writing this letter to a group of Christians that are in Rome. And uh, he he writes this around 55 AD or 55 CE. You get to choose whichever one you want to go with. Okay, I'm going to go old school and stay AD here. But but Paul didn't plant this church in Rome. Um, This was a group of Jewish and Gentile Christians. Uh, They got together. They they were believers in Jesus. And they actually started all these little house churches there in Rome. Paul's hope is that he can come to Rome, and so he can see them, he can meet them. He, again, he didn't start this, these churches, and so he wanted to know a little bit more about them. He wanted to share some theology that, that he had. But what he was really trying to do is, is gather support from them because his ultimate missionary journey is to go to Spain and to tell the people in Spain about who Jesus was and what Jesus had done, who Jesus still is in their life today. And so he goes there looking for this support so he can go to Spain. And so he writes this letter to these Christians there in Rome, a lot of it just to encourage them. Now, let me give you a little context, a little background about what's happening there in Rome at this point in time. Uh, There's actually quite a bit of religious tension there. And the religious tension is at this point between Jewish people who did not believe Jesus was the Messiah and Jewish Christians who still had uh, a lot of their, their Jewish heritage with them, but they did believe that Jesus was the Messiah. Now, at one point in time, Julius Caesar had given some pretty good religious freedoms to the Jewish people that were living in Rome, and they loved that. Emperor Claudius comes in and pulls a lot of those religious freedoms away. And so the Jewish people, whether they're Jewish or Jewish Christians, they're pretty upset. And so they actually start fighting, they start rioting, they start causing disturbances in Rome. And so in 49 AD, Claudius is like, get out. I I don't want this anymore. This is terrible. I need you to get out of here. And so they kicked out all the Jews and the Jewish Christians out of Rome. Well, around 54 AD, Claudius is assassinated and the Jewish Christians and the Jewish people were allowed back into Rome. And you think... Okay, this is a good thing. Maybe this is healthy. Well, now there's a new tension, and it's between the Jewish Christians and the Gentile Christians. See, the Gentile Christians, they never had to leave. So they're still there in Rome, and they're like, hey, we've been here for these five years while you've been gone, and here's what's happening in these home churches, and here's what leadership looks like, and we've got this covered. The Jewish Christians come in like, no, 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 no. We're like the really the, the right Christians. We're the true Christians because not only have we been baptized, but we've been circumcised too. And so there's more tension that is there, and these two groups are kind of causing more disturbances there in Rome inside the city. Not to mention, the same year, there's a new leader in town, and his name is Nero. So we have this politically and religiously charged environment. Does that sound familiar to anybody? Yeah. But here's Paul who's writing this here in Rome, uh, in Romans, and, and he, he puts chapter 13 in there, and he kind of gives this to, for the people to wrestle with, but he's really kind of calling them out on some of their actions. And so here's Paul who says that this political environment, that those people that are in charge, guess what? They're there because God has put them in those positions. Now, before you start asking why would God do this, let's kind of step back for a moment. Back, let's go back to the beginning of the Scripture in Genesis chapter 1. We, we've got everything is perfect, and, and then we find that humanity messes up. Humanity sins. And what does God do? God kicks humanity out of the garden. And so here you have humanity, and humanity's got to learn how to, how to live together, right? How to, how to live in harmony with others, which goes amazingly terrible. It doesn't work. And so we can look back at scripture, we can look back at ancient history, we can even look back or look into our world today. And here's the lesson. No matter what, we don't live in harmony well together at all. And so what do you do when everybody's kind of living in this way that there's just chaos that's reigning over everything? Well, you begin to form governments, right? 
And so you set boundaries and you put rules and regulations in, in place. The idea being we've we got to do something to protect ourselves because we don't want chaos to reign. And so as Paul is writing this in Romans chapter 13, he's like, here's the first thing. Stop causing problems in the city. And the other thing you need to do is you need to submit to authorities. And the reason is because God has allowed those authorities to be in place, to set those rules, to set those regulations, to put those boundaries there so that we can have law and order and so that we can keep chaos from reigning. Look at verse 2. So anyone who rebels against authority is rebelling against what God has instituted, and they'll be punished. For the authorities do not strike fear in people who are doing right, but in those who are doing wrong. Would you like to live without fear of the authorities? Do what is right, and they will honor you. Paul says these unwarranted rebellions against the government was the same as rebelling against God. And so again, you have these Jewish Christians and these Gentile Christians that are fighting each other. These problems are there in the city. It had to do with taxes and it had to do with government oversight and religious freedoms and religious issues and, and tensions. But Paul's like, look, if you don't agree with government leaders, if you don't agree with their policies, but that government is in place there, understand it's there because God has put it in that spot. And here's the deal. A good government will reward you for doing good. And it will punish you for doing evil. And if you're living in the will of God and you're doing this, you don't have anything to worry about. But then he gives the other side of this in verse 4. He says, the authorities are God's servants, sent for your good. But if you are doing wrong, of course you should be afraid. For they have the power to punish you. They are God's servants, sent for the very purpose of punishing those who do what is wrong. So here's Paul saying, hey, there are consequences to this. When you rebel against the government, guess what the government has? It has the power because of the power that it's been given that it can institute these rules and they can put these regulations in place. And so if you don't follow them, the government can use its force if needed. Again, government's role, reward for good, punish for evil. And some of you in your minds are thinking, but there was that one time with that one particular government who did this. I think if you look back at history, uh, even in recent history, of course, ancient history, where we have seen governments punish people who do good and reward those who do evil, that those governments don't tend to last very, very long because the government's role is to reward you for good and to punish you for evil. But then Paul continues on, verse 5. He says, so you must submit to them not only to avoid punishment, but also to keep a clear conscience. Pay your taxes, too, for these same reasons. For government workers, right, this is about Washington, D.C. area here, need to be paid. They are serving God in what they do. Give to everyone what you owe them. Pay your taxes and government fees to those who collect them and give respect and honor to those who are in authority. Here's Paul who's telling those Christians there in Rome, he's really saying, here's what you need to do. He says, you need to be a good citizen. Like, I, I know things aren't perfect. I know it's tough in Rome. I know the leaders aren't great. I know there's political tension and there's religious tension. But I want you to remember this one thing. You are called, if you're a follower of Christ, to be a good citizen on earth. And so wherever you live, whoever's in charge, whether you like them or not, whether you agree or disagree, you are to submit to their leadership. You are to pay taxes. And you are to respect and honor those in authority. Again, Paul's saying, be a good citizen. But once again, I, I know you, and, and your minds are asking questions like this. Why should I do what Paul writes here? But, but, because I can tell you I don't like or agree with Philip blank with whatever leader that is for you okay uh, in fact they make me angry they make me mad they upset me my skin crawls when I, when I see them on, on tv and, and by the way what, what they believe what what they think the way they lead man I feel it's totally against Jesus's teachings so what do I do with that well I want to spend the rest of our time uh, pulling out a, a few lessons that we really see 
in the letters that Paul writes to different churches and to groups of, of Christians. Uh, because Paul actually writes a whole lot uh, about the political arena in these letters that he's writing. And so the, the first thing I, I want us to look at actually goes back to chapter 13. In verse 8, Paul writes, Owe nothing to anyone except for your obligation to love one another. If you love your neighbor, you will fulfill the requirements of God's law. For the commandments say, you must not commit adultery, you must not murder, you must not steal, you must not covet. These and other such commandments are summed up in this one commandment. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to others, so love fulfills the requirements of God's law. I, I think the lesson that we can learn here, lesson number one here in Romans, is to love others first. Um, do you remember the good old days when there would be an election and maybe your person would lose? And uh, over the next couple of days, maybe a couple of weeks, it kind of hurt. But then you just moved on from that. Remember that? No, none of us do. Uh, because it feels like every single election cycle, like we just can't let it go. Our, our candidate, the person we voted for, they lost. And until it's the time for that next election, we just, we just build up this, 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 this tension, this anger, this hate. There's so much toxicity when it comes to politics. But, but notice what Paul doesn't say here. Paul doesn't say, hey, hey, you don't agree? You don't like the other party? You, you don't like that politician? You don't like that platform? Well, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go ahead and just add more fuel to the fire, right? Make, make it worse for the people who are on the other side. Post that hate on social media. Tell your mom how you really feel. That's not what Paul says here. Paul says, you remember that one rule? The one that Jesus seemed to come back to over and over again. Yeah, Jesus said, love your neighbor as yourself. And I feel like Paul's saying, when it comes to something like politics, that applies. That no matter who someone is, what they believe, what they think, what, what they vote, we are called to love our neighbor. Our job isn't to hate them. Our job is not to disparage them on social media. Our job is not to make them feel less than they are. Our job is not even to try to change their mind. If you're like me, you've been on social media and you read people's posts, political posts, and there'll be posts underneath that where people made comments and they're trying to change uh, the view of the person who made that original post, right? How many times do they change their minds? I can tell you, I can give you the percentage, I know. It's 0 0.0000000 to infinity percent, isn't it? It never, ever happens. Yet why do we focus on hate so much? And why are we more not about loving our neighbor? Whether they're a Democrat or a Republican or Libertarian or Green Party or Communist Party or a combination of all 15 of them, whatever it is for you, why... Why do we bring so much hate? And why don't we love our neighbors? If we want to begin to defeat the God of politics, it really starts by being a people that are full of love. love even when people think and vote differently than we might. But then here's lesson number two. We've got to pray for our leaders. I'm going to ask you three questions. I just want you internally just to think about these, chew on these a, a little bit. But... Uh, how many of you pray for our current leaders, right? Think about that. Second question. How many of you pray for current leaders only, only if they are part of your party? And here's the big question. How many of you pray for the other side's leaders? If you're praying for elected officials, if you're praying for those in authority, I don't mean, are you praying for them to get hurt, to break a leg, to be eaten by a shark, okay? I'm not talking about those kind of prayers. I don't mean praying for your candidate to win and the other candidates to lose. I'm not talking about that either. 
How many of you are spending time praying for elected officials and those in authority that may have different views than you do? How many of us spend time praying for their families and praying for their marriages, praying for their kids, praying for their health, praying for their souls? I'm guessing that percentage is probably pretty small. I love what Paul writes in 1 Timothy 2, verse 1 through 3. He says, I urge you, first of all, to pray for all people. Ask God to help them, intercede on their behalf, and give thanks for them. Pray this way for kings and all who are in authority so that we can live peaceful and quiet lives marked by godliness and dignity. This is a good, or excuse me, this is good and pleases God our Savior who wants everyone to be saved and to understand the truth. So Paul is writing this letter to his apprentice, Timothy. This isn't to a group of Christians. It's not to uh, a church. This is to a specific person, again, this student of his. And there's three things I, I love about what he says here. First thing that, that I, I see here is he says, I want you to pray for all people. Now, in the Greek, that word all means all, okay? It means anyone. It, it means everyone. So, so here's Paul saying, hey, Timothy, I want you to pray for everyone. But then he gets pretty specific here. He says, pray for those in authority. And he says, why? You pray for those in authority so there can be peace, so you can have a quiet life, so you can live a life of godliness, so that you can be full of dignity. But, but here's the kicker for me. He says, you pray for everyone, and you pray for people in authority because this is good. And notice what he says there. This pleases God. When Paul writes Romans, things are a little less chaotic there in Rome. But like I said a little bit earlier, there's been this change in leadership, and now Nero is the emperor. And at the first, he hadn't gone uh, too crazy. But when Paul writes 1 Timothy, this is around 64 uh, AD. And if you know your Roman history, that's the same year that fire swept through Rome. Uh, Nero gets upset, he blames all the Christians, and he begins to uh, begin this Christian persecution, which was a terrible moment in history. Uh, so this is when Paul is writing these words here in 1 Timothy. There had been bad times before, and, and we kind of see that when we read through Romans there. This is a different ball game. Things are worse for Christians. This is the worst time to be a follower of Christ. And yet in the midst of this, Paul writes, pray for your leaders. I wonder what Timothy thought when he gets this, this letter and all he's thinking about is everything that is happening to Christians in that time and the persecution that's happening and the things he's seeing. I'm sure in his mind he's like, wait, hold up a second. So you want me to pray for Nero? Paul's like, yep. I don't care who the leader is. I don't care what they do. I don't care what they believe. I don't care what they put into legislation or the views they may have that are different than yours. I don't care what party they're a part of or what they've done as a follower of Jesus. He's like, your duty is to pray for them. Now, again, I'm getting in your minds for a second. This is where the butts come out. It's the, but Chad, don't you know what they believe about, and fill in the blank. And it's like, yep. You know what your job is to do if you're a follower of Christ? Is to pray for them. But Chad, don't you know the legislation that they put into place and what that will mean for, again, fill in the blank. Yep. You know what Paul says? Paul says our duty is to pray for them. Sorry, when I look at Scripture, it says nothing about being people filled with anger, with hate, calling people names, posting rants on social media. When it comes to anything, when it comes to politicians and platforms and parties, when it comes to people we know and we don't know, people who think and believe and vote differently than, than we do. I don't find that in Scripture anywhere. What I find is that if that's the place you're at, and this is who you are, maybe your God is politics. 
And what Paul says, hey, if your God is the God, then the way you live your life is you love others first. You love your neighbor as yourself. And the second thing you do is you pray for those in leadership. And the reason's pretty simple. It pleases God. Which leads us to lesson number three. We've got to stop living in fear. Uh, Dr. Ryan Berg is a professor at Eastern Illinois University, and he focuses on religion. And he's on Twitter. He's got some great stuff that he, he does on religion. But he took time to examine the Association of Religion Data Archives, and he looked at some 2020 research that they did in terms of Americans and their fears. And it's kind of fascinating what he found out. He said the research showed when it came to the fear of stuff like demons, zombies, uh, Iranian nuclear attacks, public speaking, illegal immigration, and sharks. You want to know who the most fearful group was? It was people who were religious. He dug a little deeper, and here's what he found. He said, in fact, those who were regular church attenders were more fearful than infrequent church attenders. I think we look at this data, and I think we can safely say for many people who are religious, fear rules their lives. But why do we live in fear? Well, often it's because our spiritual life isn't where it's supposed to be. That we've stopped really fully following Jesus. We've stopped allowing the Holy Spirit to move and to, to lead us in our life. And, and when that's taken place, there is a spiritual void inside of us, deep inside of us. And what do you do when you have a void? You have to fill it. It's really what this series has been about, that we have this spiritual void. And so we fill it with success or pleasure or power or we fill it with something like politics. Political leaders become our Messiah. Policies become our doctrine. And activism becomes our religion. And so if our person, our party, our platform isn't voted they, they, into office, they, they lose. We go into this funk and we kind of get to this place of saying, well, you know, this woe is me type of, of syndrome. And we began to lose all hope in life. We began to say things like the end is near. And then we began to make threats that we're moving to Canada because I guess things are much better there. We make threats about giving up our citizenship. We make threats that we're going to swear ourselves off of Twitter and all these other places, which we never really, really do. And maybe what's really mission, missing is a reminder of who we truly are. If we go back to Paul, Paul, again, he writes a lot about political, uh, the political arena in these letters. And when he's writing Romans, he talks about being a good earthly citizen. In one of his other letters to a church in Philippi, he writes these words about being a good citizen of heaven. Philippians 1.27. It says, Above all, you must live as citizens of heaven, conducting yourselves in a manner worthy of the good news about Christ. Then, whenever I come and see you again, or only hear about you, I will know that you are standing together with one spirit and one purpose, fighting together for the faith, which is the good news. Here's Paul who's living through some of the toughest times to be a Christian there in the Roman Empire. Really some of the toughest times in all humanity. And then you've got all these other things that are happening there with tensions with the religious people and, and Jewish Christians and, and the Jews and, and the Gentile Christians. And so he talks about the importance of following the rule of the leaders, of showing respect and honor to those in authority. He talks about praying for leaders. But bigger than that, Paul says, hey, remember this one thing, that you are a citizen of heaven if you follow Jesus. And so as a citizen of heaven, there's nothing we should fear. That we're just passing through this place. We're just here on this earth for a short term as, as earthly citizens. That in the end, God is in control of all of this. And that fear is not needed. If you find that you are someone who worships the God of politics, then it's probably bringing about fear in your life. And then maybe we just need to take a moment to look back at Paul, what Paul was going through, what those early Christians were going through, and what happens there. 
Those should have been real moments of fear for those Christians. And yet Paul says, hey, don't, don't live in fear. Don't live in fear no matter who's leading and no matter what's happening around you. He's like, live in the comfort of Jesus. Because in the end, if you follow Jesus, you are citizen of heaven. It's a question that you're probably asking as you've listened to this morning. Maybe you're saying, hey, does this mean I shouldn't be political? Does this mean I shouldn't vote? It actually, it doesn't mean any of those things. I believe you can be political. I believe you should be involved and you should vote and you can work on campaigns. I mean, that's part of the beauty of living here in America. I believe we can be passionate about politics, but we have to be careful to not make it become our, our God. And so how about instead of worshiping the idol of politics, the God of politics, we really work hard to worship the God first. My fear, if I can say that right now, when it comes to the God of politics, is that it is ruining families, friendships, relationships, and souls. And I honestly believe out of all the gods we've talked about in this series, this might be the one that so many of us face in battle more than any other. But we can change that by being a people who love others no matter what. That we are being a people who spend time praying for our leaders no matter what side they might be on. And that we can stop living in fear and be reminded that our true citizenship isn't here. It's actually in heaven. As we finish this series today, may we let go of our God of politics, of success, of pleasure, and power, and may we fully embrace the God who loves and cares for each of us. Amen.